Where do we begin? <laughs> So we grew up at summer camp together. In playing group of friends, I was on probably the older edge of it because I did rock the cradle a little bit. And um, so I don't really ever remember meeting Dan, but I always remember knowing Dan. So my, my first thought as far back as I can think of Danielle is that we were, we were hanging out together at camp. You came by the cottage to walk with me to the tabernacle and Maybe you were still there and I was in a separate room or something, but uh, my sister said to me, you're not interested in that 14 year old, are you? Because I was 19. <laughs> and the answer was no, <laughs> no, I wasn't. But it's like almost like she planted the thought. And, and uh, then, cause you, I, I thought, oh, yeah, she's, she's, she's great, but she's like way too young. But then the next summer, however, I did kind of take a shine to you. I, I made the mistake of, um, the last day of camp, I think I had been secretly thinking all week, wow, this girl's really great. And I think she's gonna be like really awesome when she's older. I, it, with all pure best intentions like in, in mind, I, I, just, I think future tense, this girl is really awesome. Character, beauty, like everything. And I made the mistake of telling you that I thought, just you and me talking, I, I found you at the uh, volleyball court, yeah. made the mistake of telling her that I thought she'd make a really great wife someday. And, and I literally got up and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said, no, there was a line that you said before that. You oh, said, right. So I was 15 at the time and I said, Dan, I just want to get my license. Like, that's all I'm thinking about. And Not then, marriage. And then she ran away and literally <laughs> yes. ran to your mom and said, Mom, we gotta go. We have to go. It was the last day of camp already, but she, the, yes. the and leaving then was accelerating. Three days later, I got a letter in the mail. Now, of course, this was back before the internet. We became pen pals where we actually wrote letters. Yeah, and that I got would be a letter kind of where the, the pen pal thing started, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, it I was an it... apology for being so forward. And. <laughs> And that actually began year after year. We would see each other at camp for a week or two, and then we would write letters back and forth. And there was a Michael W. Smith, Amy Grant oh, yeah, duet song yes. that you eventually walked down the aisle to. Mm -hmm. Paul Shabetta played it on yeah. the piano. And it was uh, somewhere, somehow. We started quoting, it came out somewhere around then. We started quoting that song back and forth to each other in the letters. And it was said, somewhere far beyond today, I will find a way to find you. And somehow through the lonely <laughs> nights, I will leave a light in the dark. Let it lead you to my heart. Mm -hmm. And so. actually that box of letters that I kept from him, I've often said, if there was a fire in our house, even before pictures, I would grab that box and that would be the thing that I would want to save. And my children too, of course. <laughs> but it's a very special um, time for us and a very special memory we have. Yeah, so we, met, so we met at camp and then that kind of kicked off uh, every year we'd be back together again. It was become kind of an, a known quantity that Dan liked Danielle and Danielle was not interested or holding him at bay or whatever. Now you say you knew. Yeah, I think I did. I think maybe that was why I was a little bit afraid, was I feel like the Lord really did tell me early on, this is the guy for you. Um, and you know, I had dated, I had had, you know, maybe one or two other relationships. And um, it's funny, we hadn't seen each other in a very long time. And the very day that I thought about breaking it off with this other guy, I flick on the TV. Now we had lived about an hour apart from each other and we didn't see each other all the time. But I turn on the TV at lunchtime on my lunch break and wouldn't you know, Dan McCauley is singing on the television on singing. 100 Huntley Street. Yes. Singing amazing. Singing a song that he wrote and I couldn't believe my eyes. I'm seeing Dan, but what I really couldn't believe was I'm looking at the camera and I'm thinking, why does he have a green tongue? Why is he on national television with a green tongue? So at that point, 100 Huntley Street had a live studio audience and my grandma was in the audience. And at least as my grandma did, lots of grandmas do, she always had candies in her purse. So after song number one that I sang, I went up and talked to my grandma. She gave me a candy as she always did. Grandma always did. I popped it, <laughs> talked to her, sucked on the candy without thinking of it. Then it came time, oh, go do the next song. I went and did the next song and I'm singing with a bright, like, green green tongue <laughs> on 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 the TV and they're watching this is live yes so there was no redos and all I could think I remember having this moment in my head going 
that is who you're going to marry. Green the guy, guy with the green tongue. Yeah, so we had a, an evolving relationship over your late teens. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a chase, a, a one, maybe one false start. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I think when I accepted an internship to go and youth pastor in Connecticut, uh, that's when she realized he's leaving uh -oh. and he might never come back and I might lose him. And so and when I, I came decide. back to do my final semester of Bible college, you finally called again and that started the thing that never ended. About the wedding, I think just overall I remember just loving that we we're actually getting married on the grounds where we grew up together, mm -hmm. where he proposed to me, literally right on the exact same spot on the floor where we, he had proposed to me. So I thought that was just really, really sweet and, and cool. And now we still go back there every year. Um, we bring our kids back. Um, I'm telling you, I almost went into labor with our second child at that camp, and it was Brayside Camp, and we actually kind of named um, his, our youngest is named Brayden, uh, partially That's because... That's a little bit of Brayside in there. Brayden Tribute. and Brayside, yeah. So we have a lot of memories there together, and it was cool to get married there for sure. You were always just a character girl, and that lasts uh, a lifetime, and it's so true of you. So I would say one of my favorite things about you is the way that has held and the way you are always improving yourself. You're always reading, always working uh, to make your heart right and make sure the integrity is there and all that. And, and uh, that's priceless. Thank you. <laughs> and Dan is a very gifted, clearly gifted man. Um, and there's a lot of people who praise him regularly, either writing a message to him or in person, and he handles that so well, I think more so than most people, and that's very admirable, and he is, you know, the same right now than he is off camera, and um, I also feel like you are everything that I am not, so the Lord knew. And vice versa, though. When, when he stuck us together, I mean, he knew what we didn't see. He knew that I needed him and, and you needed me. Yeah, no, I always think God tricked me, like in the <laughs> best possible way, because I, I, I didn't know what I needed so much when I was 19 even, but like he, he knew the, the outward package that would attract me, but he also put inside that uh, some things I didn't even know back then that I was gonna need. Yeah, so he's a good guy. <laughs> so our married life has been full of ministry, some as pastors in church and a lot of it on the road leading worship and speaking. And because of all that traveling, we actually waited eight years before having kids. But in 2008, we had Keaton, and then in 2012, we had Brayden. That changed the way we did ministry a lot, especially for me, but we figured it out. Yeah, we decided to keep them. <laughs> uh, most challenging season in our marriage. Man, we've had a few. I would say it maybe this way. We had a, a transition out of our last uh, place that we were living forced upon us and city and job and the whole thing. Uh, out of our hands, um, some unfair treatment and um, which is what led to us being here and I mean God has a plan and all that uh, but it I think I was struggling I think we both were struggling with unforgiveness for that that uh, my boss or that 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 situation as some bitterness and unforgiveness uh, hanging out in our hearts and the thing about unforgiveness is is, is well they say it's like drinking poison and hoping that it hurts the other person and said it hurts you. And so it, I would say it, it changed me. Like a, I would say uh, in that season, I was an angry person. I had uh, just a bunch of anger. And I think it just kind of came out everywhere. Yeah, I mean, when you have unforgiveness that you're de walking through and dealing with, it doesn't, it can't stay bottled up. I mean, when we're living, when you're living with someone everyone else is going to feel it. It will seep out, and it did. And so, you know, there was some lashing so, out and, you know, different... Th 
like you said, you just became a different person. Yeah, so between what was going on in you and what was going on in me, uh, there were a lot more fights mm -hmm. and a lot more screaming matches. And uh, I mean, it got bad enough. I mean, there was one time you, that Christmas Eve, Literally, I think it was actual Christmas Day. It was Christmas Eve. Okay. And I remember it well. I just remember the only time I've ever felt like that is it. Like, you've got to go. I think we were driving from one family to the next for Christmas, and something was blowing up. And I remember just, like, pulling over, parking the car, and being like, okay, you're out. Time out. You're done. And that moment was fleeting, but um, it was impactful enough to real for us to realize, okay, we need to talk to somebody else. We can't just carry this all between us. And so that led us to some counseling. And yeah, we found yeah. ourselves in marriage counseling, um, which I think far too often, and maybe, maybe this is why it's good to bring up, Far too often people see a stigma with, oh, they had to go to counseling, oh. Mm -hmm. But I think too many marriages, too many couples make the mistake of waiting too long before going. We had a, some, so what happened was we went, found ourselves in marriage counseling, but we found ourselves in marriage counseling talking about what had happened to us in, in our last employee uh, more. And it just kept coming back to that. And was, But as we kind of worked through that, uh, it it worked through what we had oh, worked we through had too. We had so much healing. Like there, we were talking about years of issues, and um, and boy, did that do us good to have somebody shepherd us and take us along um, to a place of healing, t so we could forgive that outside person. But we also had healing in our marriage, and um, it hasn't. I mean, that's eight. Maybe by the end of it, seven years ago it hasn't been anything close to that and ever mm -hmm. since that's like I feel sick to my stomach thinking about that season yeah but it was it was on a knife's edge so you know I would say to couples watching just don't be afraid to reach out because um, mm -hmm. you there's only so much you can handle and you can carry just the two of you too many couples wait too long before admitting that they need help and getting some help. There isn't a stigma in getting some help. Uh, there are people who have walked there before you who have wisdom, who know the way out of your situation. And even in our case, simply talking about it and working through some other forgiveness things spilled over to us because at our core, there's nothing really wrong. It was, it was a kind of poisoning that was going on just in us personally. That's another reason why the best gift that you can give your spouse is a healthy version of you, is, is making sure that you are maintaining a relationship with God, that you are working out some of these personal issues and stuff. Yeah. So that was tough, but I mean, we've been through a lot and those things just make you stronger when you know. Okay, we've done that, we've overcome, we can do it again because who knows, we walk through seasons. Whether your marriage is, a, you feel like your marriage is in shambles or you feel like we're, we're good, don't get complacent even in the we're good, but, but to keep investing in it. Um, because I have to say that the very best thing that has happened, I think, for our marriage is becoming a part of a better us. Mm -hmm. When Ron and Ann asked us to be a part of the show, we're like, are you sure? I mean, we're like, because, you know. We're just a regular well, you, couple, you, yeah. Everybody carries this, like, secret, I think, or guilt and shame of, like, yeah, but we fight. And we went, like, so they're asking us to be a, a part of a show. And, you know, I'm still thinking, yeah, but I'm thinking back to that season where we almost, you know, we're almost called time out or whatever. Marriage is like your waistline. If you're not paying attention, it will go in a direction you don't want it to go, right? Um, but so you you have to continually be um, attentive to your marriage so that it doesn't go go south, <laughs> go to a place you don't want it to go. Just don't be ashamed to talk to someone and get help. And I think even in talking to even just an ordinary average friend that you can trust, you find out that oh, we're not we're not weird. 
that we had that we fought like that or we're not weird that we're struggling or we're not this it's it's pretty normal and i think we're all in the same boat